Welcome back. This is session 24 of an ongoing series on spiritual gifts. And we welcome those of you who are watching by DVD. And we welcome those of you who are in the classroom and have been very faithful in attending this class. And we thank you. This session, in the last session, we talked about teaching. And teaching is my gift. And I spent some time, probably more time than on the other gifts, talking a little bit about teaching is making clear what a teacher has read in the Bible. So clear that people understand it and they can apply it to their lives. We also talked about how the Bible warns teachers not many should be teachers because if you are a teacher, you will be held to a stricter standard when you are uh, standing before Jesus and being uh, judged. So it's a very sobering thing for teachers to recognize that yes, in fact, uh, there will be a day of reckoning where we had better be teaching the truth and not have been false teachers. Well, in this session, we are going to talk about a very controversial gift. And in fact, in the next one, we're going to continue our discussion because they go in hand in hand. This session, we'll talk about the spiritual gift of tongues. And we're also going to talk next session about the spir spiritual gift of interpretation. Uh, you're supposed to have both of those present if the gift is ever used. Later, I will talk about the controversial nature of this gift. But for now, I am going to just begin, as we've done before, to talk about uh, the verses that it's mentioned, the Greek word it comes from, uh, the meaning of it, the definition, the purpose, and the role. When we get to commentators, I'll make comments on how controversial this gift is in the church today. Well, if you will open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12, we will be in 12, 13, and 14 during this session for the most part. And in 12, 13, and 14, each of those talks about spiritual gifts. Why have I not mentioned 13 and 14 as main passages? It's because those also talk about gifts, but they just give explanation of what has been said previously. 1 Corinthians 13 says that the motivation for using spiritual gifts is love. And in 1 Corinthians 14, it gives some warnings about using the gift of prophecy as well as the gift of tongues, and it compares the benefits of those two. So we will spend an entire session on each of those in the future. In, on the chalkboard here, you can see some symbols. There's a star and a large box that's open, a smaller box that's filled, a crazy symbol, a large diamond, another crazy symbol, and then a small diamond. Now, I have to tell the people in the classroom, this reminds me very much of looking at Russian words. As I walk through the streets of Russia and I see the signs, it just looks like nonsense to me. You use a different language than we use in the United States. You use a different alphabet. Many of your letters are not letters that we use. We use an alphabet based on the Roman alphabet, and you use one that comes from the Byzantine Empire, the Cyrillic, uh, Cyrillic uh, language. And in some cases, it has very similar uh, features as ancient Greek. But as I've told you before, we have an expression, it's all Greek to me, meaning I don't understand it. So I walk around, I don't understand it. I'm just grateful that sometimes they'll have pictures on the store windows, and it at least tells me what the store might be. So it's very, uh, very frustrating. Well, I, look at that. Uh, is there anybody who can tell me what it says? Come on, a anybody? Any uh, no, I, can some of you on the DVD, can you look at it and tell me, what, a, what does that mean? Is it just nonsense? No, it actually is a word. It is a word from 
the word processing program Word, where there are different fonts and you can change the look of the text to different styles. And if you go all the way down to the bottom, there are several ones that have symbols like this. And the one this comes from is called web dings. And each ding in the web ding actually is a letter. And this one is a letter. And I wonder if now you know what word it is. That means tongues. And the reason I use that as an illustration is it's very similar to what the gift of tongues is all about. People typically hear language they don't understand. It's all nonsense to them. It's words and phrases and pronunciations and accents that absolutely a person cannot comprehend. And yet, it's actual words that are from the heavenly language that angels use. And they are words that some people speak and other people interpret. And it would be very similar to someone coming into the classroom, coming into the place you're watching the DVD, looking at it and go, oh, yeah, that's tongues. All right? It is an amazing thing, one that I have witnessed before, but I should tell you, I don't speak in tongues. But I know people who speak in tongues. And I've talked to those people, and they t have told me some things that I have found very interesting that I'll share with you. And it is very possible, in my opinion, that you might speak in tongues that you might already have spoken in tongues, or that it may be a gift that lies dormant, and because it's so controversial, you have not allowed the Spirit to have full flow in your life to speak in tongues. And hopefully at the end of this, you might have more confidence that in my belief, it is a gift that is here today, where the controversy is, others say it ended long ago, and it's not here now. So we'll talk about the controversy later. Let's go in the Bible to where this word is actually used. And if you would open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we have been here many, many times, and we're going there once again to look in context to what this, uh, how this word is used. If you'll look in 1 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 10, Paul is listing a variety of gifts, and he says, to another Christian, miraculous powers is given. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. That's the gift of discernment we've talked about before. And to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. Now, notice that it just doesn't say speaking in tongues. It says speaking in different kinds of tongues meaning it's plural. There is more than one type of tongue being spoken, and it's spoken in more than one context. And we'll learn about that as we continue. But as we move on, we think that's the only way tongues would be spoken. It may be spoken in an entirely different way. After all, it's the language used in heaven. How would we know? I don't think it's the language we can use. I certainly hope they speak English. And many of you hope they speak your language. The students here have a joke that the heavenly language is Russian because no one can understand it. In any case, in 1 Corinthians 12, the word that is used there in the Greek is glousa. Glousa. And it is in Strong's Concordance, G1101. And for those of you watching who are seminary students, I would encourage you to either get out your Strong's Concordance or go online to a website like uh, blueletterbible.com and go to the section where you can look this word up for yourself. Well, that same word is used throughout the different times that tongues is mentioned. And the second time it's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12 comes in verse 28 
through 30. This is where uh, Paul is listing a variety of gifts, many of which we have talked about previously, some which we'll talk about in the future. And Paul writes, And in the church God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gift of healing, those able to help others, those with the gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Please notice that it's listed last. And as we said previously, this list doesn't mean certain gifts are more important than others. They're all equal. Instead, it is organized into the categories of roles we've talked about before. The apostles, they were involved in founding the church. The prophets and the teachers, their role was instructing the church. As you go down to workers of miracles and healing and help, uh, is, is caring for the church. The gift to helps, the gift of administration, those are gifts of managing the church. And this last one is a special category of communicating a message from God. And it only really involves tongues and interpretation of tongues. All right, it's listed last because it has the least impact on the church. It, this is listed in order of the scope of impact the gifts have. Apostles are always listed first. The scope of their impact in ministry is enormous. It expands the whole church. The ones for profits, little less because it's not reaching everyone. Teachers, little less. And then it goes all the way down and Paul is basically saying of all the gifts, the one that has the least impact is tongues. Not that it's not important, but that it's not going to impact a lot of people. In fact, he says the tongues are primarily for the church. But there is a category of tongues that are used that's meant to be a sign to unbelievers. And we'll see that in the book of Acts later. Well, what's the meaning of this word glossa, the Greek word for tongues? Well, it's funny that it actually means the tongue. That's what glossa means. It's a member of the human body. And since the human body is being used as an analogy of the church, it's a member of the church who's using this spiritual gift. But there's another connotation to this. That is, it's a language or a dialect that's actually known. And it's used by a particular people who are distinct from other nations. And as we'll see in the book of Acts, Tongues were spoken in a language that actually is known by the listeners, but the person speaking didn't know the language. So there are two types of tongues spoken. We talked about different kinds. One is the heavenly language, unknown to people on earth, but understood by the people with interpretation and spoken by the people with the gift of tongues. Then there's another kind of tongues that is spoken where it is a language. It could be Spanish or Chinese or Russian or English, but it's the person speaking. They don't know the language. I don't know the Russian language. But if I was to speak in this kind of tongue, I would speak Russian and I would not know what I was saying. But all of you would hear me in your language. So that is the second kind of tongues. I. In the meaning of this word, the last thing is the supernatural gift of speaking in another language without having learned that language. The definition that we're going to use in our study is to speak a language unknown to the speaker. In the other example, it was people listening knew, the speaker didn't. So in all cases, the speaker doesn't know what they're saying. They're speaking, and it may sound like nonsense to them, but it's speaking either the heavenly language or a foreign language that they've never studied and they've never learned. One of the two. What's the purpose of tongues? Why would God give us nonsense language? 
why would God give us the ability to speak a foreign language and we don't know it and only be able to speak it on certain occasions? Not to be able to speak it all the time. It seems like something is amiss, not quite connecting. Why would you do this, God? Well, there is a public use of tongues that explains why God do, does this, and there's a private use of tongues. The public use is to bring a message to the church that is given in such a way that the church knows for sure it's from God. It isn't a false message. There's a safeguard. A person speaks in tongues, a different person interprets the tongue. Now, it is possible for the same person to have the gift of interpretation while they also have the gift of tongues. But God will authenticate his message, thereby giving his stamp of approval on what was shared. It really was from God. So it, it's when they're supposed to bring a message, typically one of warning, or it might be, as in a prophet, a word of comfort, it might be for telling the future. So this gift is linked with prophecy. It's prophecy spoken in another language un, unknown to the speaker. And it is a message from God. The second use in a public setting is not to give it at church a message, but it's to be used as a sign to unbelievers. Often this is used out on the mission field where you might be in Africa and you speak in a sudden language that you would not know. When I was in Angola, they speak Umbutu. Umbutu is a tribal language known by just a few. I don't know that you're going to be able to go on Amazon.com and get a book in Umbutu. But Umbutu would be a language that if I was there and God called me to preach the gospel and gave me the supernatural ability to speak in Umbutu, naturally those people would hear it and understand it. So that's the second use in public. How about in private? Many people speak tongues in worshiping God in their private time with God. It isn't that they go, all right, let me speak in tongues, and then I'll pray, and then I'll... It is in the moment, in God's anointed time, in his kairos, the Holy Spirit comes and empowers the believer to speak in a heavenly language of constant praise and worship to the glory of God. And I know many people who use tongues in private worship. Truthfully, I don't know anybody who speaks in tongues at church. I don't have too many friends who go to the charismatic church or who are Pentecostal, which we associate with tongues. But they speak it. They interpret it. So I believe there must be something to it. But there is a caution. When speaking the heavenly language, you are never to speak it in the church unless an interpreter is present. If you sense a message is being given, you stand up and you start speaking in this language that is nonsense to both, to most, and nobody's there to stand up and interpret, the Bible says, stop speaking it. If you would look at 1 Corinthians 14 and go down to verse 27, you'll see that explicit command from God. And he's talking about orderly worship here in this chapter. He says, What then shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All these must be done for strengthening the church. That's the purpose. And if anyone speaks a tongue, two or at most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should be quiet in church and speak to himself in that language about God. So very clear in terms of that restriction. Well, what's uh, the role then of tongues in the church? 
Well, this is, as I mentioned before, communicating a special message to God and then someone interpreting it so people can understand that special message from God. Now, I'm not going to go to the commentators this time. I'm going to deviate just a little bit because I want to talk about how controversial this gift is and how many times it keeps the body of Christ apart. Like evangelicals, they look down on the Charismatics and the Pentecostals. How could you people be so wrapped up in that gift stuff and healing and miracles and all that? And then the people who are in Pentecostal and Charismatic Church, they look at their brothers and sisters in the Evangelical Church and say, why aren't you extending grace to us? Why aren't you believing that God is moving in our community, perhaps in a different way than yours? Instead, friction between those two groups, fights over what it means, what it doesn't mean, is it present, it is not present. Sometimes I think when we get to heaven and we stand as a community before Jesus, he's going to go, why did you guys fight about such stupid stuff? Why did you fight about tongues? Why did you fight about healings? How come you fought over whether somebody should be baptized, immersed in water, or whether it was okay to sprinkle water on them? That wasn't the point of the gospel. The point was, people need a savior. They needed me. And you were to tell them, Jesus is the only way. So in some ways, I think, these arguments are pointless, but they're also human. We are sinners. We always fall short. We always want to think our way is the right way and that if everybody would just follow our way, the world would be a much better place in which to live. Or me. Of course, it wouldn't be a better place for the other people. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amounts, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. So, the main argument is, is tongues a gift for this generation of the church? Or did it cease to exist at an earlier time? And it all comes down to an interpretation of some key verses in 1 Corinthians 13. So if you just move back one chapter, the great chapter of love, and you look right at the end of the chapter, I'm going to go from 8 to 13. This is the, chap uh, the section that people disagree on and creates the fi friction. And I'll explain that difference of opinion after we hear the verses. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I came, became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall be fully known. Uh, I shall fully know, even as I am fully known. And then the great summary of love. And now these things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Which is ironic, since right before it is a passage that we're fighting about. And then right at the end, but the greatest of these is love. But I don't love you because you don't believe the way I believe. Pretty ironic, don't you think? All right, so here's what people think about who are in the charismatic Pentecostal church. They look at the verses that say, prophecies will cease, tongues will cease, knowledge will cease, and they say, how much clearer could it be? They ceased. They believe that in those, the gift of tongues was only needed by the first generation church because they had no Bible. And because the people who were hearing the gospel, they needed to have an authentic way to know, to verify this is from God. So,
tongues was a way to do that. And therefore, tongues, when the Bible came around, they weren't needed anymore. So they went away. That's their view. But those who believe that tongues are for this generation, they believe that they still exist and they look at things like, but when perfection comes, perfection meaning Jesus Christ, His second coming, then the imperfect will disappear. All that other stuff, it'll go away, including tongues and prophecies. So they say, Jesus hasn't come. So until he comes, tongues still exist. And it is a fight that we're never going to know the truth, this side of heaven. And so my challenge to the church is, let's love one another. Let's believe that everyone can worship God in a way that that community of believers, that they believe will be a way to fulfill their lives, help them to meet with God and let's stop fighting each other over minor stuff. Let's major on the major points and not major on the minor points. The second kind of uh, argument is on the kinds of tongues. We talk about private worship, public worship at church, and evangelical worship. Well, there are some people that say there is no evangelical sharing of the gospel because that was done in the book of Acts and it doesn't have anything to do with today. So therefore, it was just used for a while. And then there's one final conflict between two camps. The charismatics look towards the evangelicals and say, please, brothers and sisters, let us be free to worship God as we choose. And evangelicals say, not only do you guys speak tongues, and they passed away. But because you speak tongues, you put the focus on emotion, on stirring people up deep in their hearts, of getting them all excited and having faith be based on emotion rather than on the Word of God. So what, once again, let's make sure that we don't fight one another. There is a view in the charismatic Pentecostal church for which I draw a boundary and I say, I can't believe that you believe this truth. And please think carefully of whether it is true. Charismatics believe that when you come to Christ, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit, become part of the church. But they believe that when you speak in tongues, there is a second baptism and that allows you to fully experience the Christian life. And until you speak in tongues, you will never know the deeper, richer joy of being a Christian. Well, to me, that divides the church into two groups. There's the first class Christians who have spoken in tongues, and then Christians second class who haven't. And right away, I'm going to look down at those ones who haven't spoken in tongues like, ha, 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 I speak in tongues and you don't. I think Jesus wants unity in the church and that it is not a sign that somehow you have a special blessing. And so please, Charismatics, Pentecostals, think carefully about that doctrine. I know I'm simplifying it, but don't you think that Jesus wants the church to be one? And why would he divide us into two classes of people? Well, the visual aid we're going to use is the one on the screen. And later we'll come back to this on the gift of interpretation. Let's turn to the book of Acts for one biblical example of how this gift was used. And this is the one that the people who say tongues cease to exist, they use and say, yeah, it happened one time, but it never happened again. It was just a one-time deal and it was needed for the start of the church. Beginning at verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, 50 days after Christ rose from the, uh, into heaven, they all came together in one place and suddenly, like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the house where they were sitting, and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. 
and all of them were enabled with the Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. The apostles spoke in the languages of the world. They didn't know. The people of Jerusalem, a very cosmopolitan place, they heard it in their own tongues and they were bewildered and later it says they were amazed and they praised God for it. Now, I don't have any personal examples because I don't speak in tongues. But I've told you I do know people whom I trust and have confidence in who do speak in tongues in a private worship setting. And I believe that tongues exist for this generation. I would rather not put limits on what God can do. I would rather have a very wide net of the things that God is capable of doing. He says he's able to do the impossible. Why would he not be able to allow people to speak in tongues even in this generation? So I have some questions for you. As we've done before, listen to them, apply them to your lives, ask yourself if any of these are true, and if any one of them are, perhaps this is your gift. Has God worked through you to, number one, praise Him in private devotions in a language you don't know. Number two, deliver a message from God to a local church in a language you don't know. Or three, share the gospel with unbelievers while speaking in their language, but you do not know that language. Now, you may not ever have done this, but if in your spirit you resonate with it, that you say, boy, wouldn't that be something? Then think about, you might have this gift and allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Well, please come back and join us in the next session where we talk about the counterpart uh, part to this gift, interpretation. Thanks for being here.